Um, as uh, you uh, you will mention, you know, I uh, work at uh, Stanford University. Uh, this is our uh, new hospital, and I, I am the chief of uh, Scalby City and Pituitary City here at Stanford. And uh, the, uh, this is my team, you know, in pituitary surgery, uh, like in medicine, you know, it's very important to have a good team around you. Uh, and uh, in particular, to have an excellent endocrinology team, as I do, and, and an excellent uh, rhinology team, because we do a lot of these operations through the nasal cavity, and we do with the endoscopic and the nasal approach, and therefore doing as a team is, uh, you know, very important uh, for patient care. The, um, I'm going to start giving you a brief overview of the anatomy of the pituitary gland. It's important that you guys understand the pituitary gland, uh, its location, its shape, etc. So as you uh, probably all know, the, the pituitary gland has, this is, a, this is a sagittal view, a side view of the pituitary gland with a midline, mid-sagittal cut. And it has an anterior lobe, which is larger, and uh, um, as, you, as you know, produce a number of hormones. And then we have a posterior lobe. That is smaller is the neurohypothesis, and in between there is something called the pars intermedia, uh, because as you probably studied in embryology, the anterior lobe uh, and the posterior lobe have different embryological origins, and as they come together in development, there is a uh, uh, there is a, a cleft in between called ratsis cleft, where sometimes probably you've heard about the ratsis cleft cyst. It's a type of cyst that forms in this in this uh, cleft in between both lobes. And then you have the pituitary stock. The pituitary stock receives fibers both on the anterior and the posterior lobe. We're looking at the pituitary gland from the top. And all these are dissections done here at my, at my lab at, at Stanford. And you see the anterior gland, and you see significantly larger than the posterior gland. And you see fibers that come from the posterior gland, but also from the anterior gland here. And uh, they both form the infundibulum or the pituitary stock that connects superiorly with the hypothalamus. And then you see an eye, uh, another side view of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland sits on the cella. The cella is this cavity uh, uh, of bone uh, that is on the sphenoid. This is the sphenoid bone seen from above. And you see here, this is the uh, uh, lesser wing of the sphenoid, anterior clinal process. Uh, this is the cella itself. This prominence here, we call the tuberculum cella. This uh, bone behind the cella is the dorsum cella, which has the posterior clinoids on each uh, side. So this, these are the boundaries of the cella and of the pituitary gland. And you see there is a groove on each side of the cella. This groove contains a very important structure, of course, which is the pituitary, which is the choroid artery that runs in an area called the cavernous sinus, which we'll explain uh, shortly. If we start putting more structures around, you see this is the pituitary gland now within the cella. The tuberculum cella is at the front of it. The dorsum cell is at the back of it. Do you see how the posterior gland is sort of hidden in that dorsum cella? And this is the anterior gland here. And then you see this is the groove for that choroid artery, which is being cut here. And we call this the paracellar uh, region because it's adjacent to the cella. And this paracellar region is very important. Again, is the area of the cavernous sinus. We're looking again at the pituitary gland from the side. And you see nicely the anterior globe and then here the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, and then superiorly the uh, pituitary stock. If we put more structures here, you see again the anterior and posterior lobes, and the stock going on towards the third ventricle because the stock uh, connects with the hypothalamus, which is for which forms the part of the floor and the lateral walls of this third ventricle. And as you all know, we have the optic chasm above the pituitary gland. That's why when we have pituitary tumors, we always worry about these tumors as they grow, putting pressure in the optic apparatus above, on the optic chasm above the pituitary gland. Um, as we said, the pituitary stock, as you see here, another dissection done in my laboratory, you see the pituitary gland here, the stock connects with the area of the hypothalamus, which is a highly complex area. And uh, you see, we have the chasm in front, the stock getting to the third ventricle, the mammary right behind. Uh, this is an area of the midbrain of uh, high complexity. The hypothalamus is what controls, as you all know, the pituitary gland. And you see again a nice view of the pituitary gland, anterior lobe, posterior lobe, pituitary stock, 
connection with the, with the hypothalamus. And, uh, you know, uh, my team, my fellows in the lab, these, these amazing dissections of the hypothalamic region. I had an interest in studying this because I do a lot of operations in this area, especially for a type of tumor called craniopharyngioma. It's a tumor that comes not from the pituitary gland, but from the pituitary stalk and the connection of the stalk with the hypothalamus. It's a highly complex tumor that we also operate through an endonasal approach. And it's important for us to understand the anatomy of this area of uh, the hypothalamus. Uh, we can roughly define the hypothalamus in, in, in three uh, uh, areas, anterior, posterior, and intermediate, or what we call also supraoptic area, what we call tuberal infundibular area that it connects with the, with the infundibulum, and the posterior area or the mammillary area where the mammary bodies are uh, located. And these anterior, tuberal, and posterior regions of the hypothalamus, they all have multiple nuclei and different functions. Uh, you know, anterior hypothalamus, as you see here, mostly controls, you know, oxytocin and vasopressin release, which connect with the uh, posterior gland to the uh, pituitary stalk or infundibulum. Um, and then we have the uh, posterior hypothal hypothalamus that control, uh, you know, many other functions that are, you know, basic for a normal uh, body uh, homeostasis and, and, and regulation. That's why injury to the hypothalamus can have, you know, very severe consequences in, in, in the brain functioning and body functioning. We've also studied the vascular supply of the, of the pituitary gland. It, this comes mostly from what we call the superior hypophysial artery. These are branches that come from the carotid artery directly. And these branches go to the uh, infundibulum and they, they, they send branches down along the infundibulum to the pituitary gland. Uh, understanding the anatomy of these branches is important, not so much for pituitary surgery, but especially for uh, surgery above the pituitary, for cranopharyngiomas in particular. But these are the main supply for the, or for the uh, pituitary gland. There is also something called the inferior hypophysial artery that travels in the cavern of sinus, which I'll show you. That is less relevant, but it still provides vascular supply also. So when we, we talk about pituitary adenomas, we talk about pituitary gland, its anatomy, its location, its structures around. We'll talk a bit more about cavernous sinus in a minute, but pituitary adenomas uh, are for the most part benign tumors uh, that come, of course, from the pituitary tissue itself. And they were classically classified on uh, two major categories, non-secretor, which were well, the null cell adenomas. These are tumors that do not have cells that stain for anything. As you will see now, we include in this category also gonadotroph adenomas. There are tumors that uh, stain for uh, the gonadotrophin uh, hormones, but they do not secrete them. And approximately half of the tumors are non-secretor. The other half are secretor, secretory tumors. And we had three major categories. Uh, prolactinomas, produce prolactin. Growth hormone uh, adenomas, produce acromegalur giantism. We want to review this in a minute. And then ACTH tumors that produce or cause Cushing's disease. As I said, LH, FSH tumors or gonado, gonadotroph adenomas, they cause no symptoms. So we include them now in the non secretor um, uh, tumor category because they don't produce any hypersecretory symptoms. Um, as I said, most adenomas are benign uh, with, uh, and I would say probably 95 to 99% of the adenomas are benign, but there is a group of them that are, uh, that they are uh, more atypical uh, and more aggressive. And very, very rarely there, are, there is something called pituitary carcinomas. They can even have metastasis, but this is extremely, extremely rare. Um, there is a more uh, uh, updated classification of pituitary tumors that has been recently proposed by the uh, WHO. And this is based on the uh, uh, transcription, the cell lineages for uh, each adenoma, uh, uh, for the adenoma cell type. And this is driven by transcription uh, factor expressions. Um, so as we said, you know, from the stem cell, from the rat, rat pouch stem cell, there are three different transcription factors, which are TP, PIT1, SF1. And each of them gives uh, different cell lineages. So corticotroph lineage is tepid, and that's where ACTH tumors come from. But we also have a type of tumor that is called 
a silent cortical drop adenoma. These are tumors that are, are known to be more invasive, but they are non-secretor. They do not cause cousins. They do not increase ACTH levels. Uh, and then there is the ACTH secreting tumor. Then we have the PID-1 tumors, the PID-1 lineage, uh, which includes both the somatotroph adenomas, the growth hormone adenomas, and the lactotroph adenomas, which are the prolactinomas. And there is something called a mixed uh, tumor or a plurihormonal tumor where it has multiple uh, tumors, uh, both growth hormone, both prolactin adenomas, and a very rare type of tumor, functional tumor, actually called tyrotroph, uh, where the tumors produce TSH. Uh, and these are rare tumors, uh, but we see them eventually. And, and the plurihormonal type and also include the tyrotroph uh, type of adenoma. The PID-1 lineage, we are learning recently that these tumors are actually the most invasive and the ones that are most invasive to the uh, cavernous sinus in particular. This is new, new research we're coming up with. Um, and then we have the SF1, uh, which are the most benign of all these uh, categories, which is the mostly the gonadotroph uh, uh, lineage. Um, now, how do we treat uh, P2 adenomas, uh, which at the same time is what are the symptoms of pituitary adenomas? As you can imagine, many of these adenomas are found incidentally, and then we need to decide when to treat them. Some others are uh, uh, found because they cause problems. If it's a non secreton tumor, uh, the most important factor is size. What is the tumor size? Because as they grow, they can compress the optic apparatus. Typically, a non secreton adenoma that is smaller than a centimeter, we observe. And if it grows over time, we might offer an intervention, especially if it's a young patient. Uh, tumors that are more than one centimeters, we can also observe usually the two centimeter size is the, of course, you need to look at the variations of, on, on, based, on, based on imaging, but it's typically at two centimeters of size when tumors start compressing the optic apparatus and perhaps start causing some mild visual symptoms. As you know, they start with a superior quadrant defect and typically evolves to a full bitemporal hemianopsia for you know, really large uh, adenomas. So size is an important factor. We also sometimes see patients presenting with headaches. Um, and this is always a difficult dilemma. Is, are the headaches because of the tumor uh, or are because of something different? Obviously, there are multiple reasons for headaches. Um, usually, I, I look at patients and I see they had a family history of headaches. If they were previously healthy and the headaches are relatively new, and there is a coincidence in time with the tumor and the headaches uh, that could explain or could relate with the tumor. Uh, so it's another factor, not very strong factor, but another factor to consider uh, uh, for pituitary tumors when they cause headaches. There were some studies in the past that showed that they actually measure with probes the pressure inside the cella and increased pressure correlated to some extent with the presence of headaches. And we know patients with cysts in the pituitary can also present with headaches. So yes, the pituitary doesn't hurt itself, obviously, but the lining that surrounds the pituitary can really hurt. And, and so patients can, you know, cause, can present with headaches and pituitary tumors. Uh, we also see that these headaches can resolve with an operation. So although we always need to be careful with the correlation, yes, pituitary tumors can be a cause of headaches, of course. Um, then we have secretory tumors. And the type of tumor, the type of tumor is going to depend on the type of syndrome or hormone that is hypersecreting. The uh, first prolactinomas, as you will see, prolactinomas are uh, treated with medication first in most instances. In most cases, we treat with medication first. Medication is, uh, are the so called dopamine agonist. First line of treatment is cabergoline, is a bit more effective with a bit less side effects than. Promocryptin, which is a more is an older medication, but it's still effective. In general, uh, medication is effective in about ninety percent of patients. Will be effective to, to what we see with with medic this medication is very effective in decreasing the prolactin levels in the majority of patients, about ninety percent. Now, this medication is not curative. I would say the studies show that only about twenty to thirty percent of patients would have can be cured with medication, meaning that the tumor will disappear will become small enough that you could stop medication and the tumor doesn't really grow back. Um, so the caveat with this medication is that it needs to be taken long-term or forever. It's usually two or three times a week and you start with a low dose. And most patients do well with medication, but there are a few that have side effects from the medication. They don't tolerate. 
And those are the cases that we might consider for uh, surgery. I'll give you some examples later on when to operate on prolactinomas. But for now, it's important to, for you to remember prolactinomas are treated with medication as the first line of treatment, uh, with exceptions. The rest, growth hormone that causes acromegaly, ACTH that causes incusions disease, surgery is the first line of treatment. Uh, medication uh, first is used only to improve symptoms is we have patients that are very severely uh, uh, affected by the uh, uh, um, excess of hormones can be treated with medication for a while before surgery to optimize them. Uh, but he, practically these patients go into surgery uh, uh, as a first option with the possibility of medication before, but not often. And if they are not in remission, they'll need medication after as we will we will discuss. Um, treatment with radiation, it is something that is uh, used only when uh, tumors um, are still active after an operation and after even medication or when there is significant residual tumor that is growing, we can also use radiation. I personally am very conservative using radiation in, because radiation can damage the pituitary gland. So I tend to be very conservative recommending radiation about, about only one or two percent, only the one or two percent of my patients will need radiation after an operation in the in the long in the in the midterm, I would say. So let's talk about the uh, endonasal approach to this. How do we operate these tumors? So we use the endoscopic endonasal approach, the skull base. Uh, this approach that has revolutionized skull base surgery and of course pituitary surgery because we can do so much better than with traditional approaches. Uh, this is the view we have of the sphenoid sinus as we enter, uh, as we open the sinuses. You see there's the pituitary gland in the center, the cellac with the pituitary gland inside. This is the area of the tuberculum. And then we have the um, carotid arteries on each side, the paracellar space and the optic nerve prominence above. Um, as we said, you know, for the, the microscope, uh, the transphenoidal approach, uh, endonasal transphenoidal approach, probably the tumors was introduced, you know, in the 50s and later in the 60s with a microscope. And it was, is, uh, you know, very well established operation, but it, it is limited in, your, in what you can visualize. You need to put a microscope and, you know, look through a tunnel made through either the lip or the one of the nostrils. So at the end, your visualization is very focal. It's very good quality, but it's very focal. So is good for only tumors that are within the cella and not really large tumors because it, it becomes a very blind surgery. And that's why the endoscopic approach really expands this view of the whole, you know, cellar and paracellar and supracellar region. And the endonasal approach, we can do so much better. I can give you an example here. Uh, this is someone else's operation, but you can see here, this is a, a view with an endoscope that is quite expanded. And uh, this is a, an old fashioned surgeon that their ENTs are doing the approach with the endoscope. And then he puts the speculum on the microscope and look how the uh, visualization has decreased dramatically. You can only see this much uh, with, the, with the microscope. And then if you see this is removing the pituitary tumor, you see how poor this visualization is. Now it's much better under the, vis the, the, the microscope viewer, but it's still, you can only see the cella itself and a little bit above, a little bit below, a little bit to the side, and that's it. With the endoscope, which is now being used, you can see so much better, so much more. So the use of the endoscope has really revolutionized how we do pituitary surgery. Uh, typically, we do this operation with our ENT colleagues. They not only open the sinuses and help us with the closure, but they also drive the endoscope. So while they drive the endoscope, we can use two hands to do the operation. So it's uh, actually dynamic endoscopy working together as a team, uh, which makes an operation so much better than uh, either working alone or with a holder. Because this dynamic view, you know, right now is the soon is getting closer to the field as I'm doing that with my two instruments. And we can do, you know, the most complex tumors, I mean, the most complex pituitary tumors can be removed with an endonasal approach because we can do a wider exposure with excellent visualization. We can even go into the brain space and remove tumors from those areas uh, using these, these uh, more advanced techniques. 
we use special instruments like these ones. There are long instruments. These are micro scissors. Uh, I have developed my own set of instruments that, to do these operations uh, and allow me to, you know, uh, open the cavern of sinus and the optic canals and things like that when I need to. Um, now, one of the most common questions when we do pituitary surgery that, I, uh, that patients ask is, is uh, are you going to preserve my gland? Are you going to damage my gland? So these tumors come from the pituitary gland. Uh, but there is always a good plane of separation between the gland and the tumor. The gland and the tumor look different, different consistency, different color, um, different texture, texture. So you can really separate one from the other. And as you see here, this patient, we are separating the tumor from the gland. The gland is flattened superiorly. On the MRI, you see that the gland takes contrast. So it is white thing. Uh, remember, in MRIs, the tumors, uh, uh, take less contrast than the pituitary gland. So a T1 uh, with contrast MRI would look like this. The gland will look white, it's enhanced, will look hyper intense. And then the tumor will look, look you know, iso intense, as you see here, is, you know, light gray versus, you know, uh, white. This is tumor, this is pituitary gland. And the same, in surgery, we can differentiate this gland. This is the gland here that you're seeing right here. And the tumor here is being is being removed. And you can see, you do this MRI after the operation. This is the MRI before. What is the gland here? The gland was displaced all the way here. This patient has a bit of bleeding inside. This, right, you see right here, is, is blood, which looks white too. Um, but the gland is displaced to the side. After the operation, you see the gland has recovered its shape for the most part, except this little part is being damaged because these tumors do damage the pituitary gland you lose some of the pituitary tissue, uh, but for the most part, looks like a normal pituitary gland uh, after the operation. There is a very important uh, entity for you guys to remember, which is pituitary apoplexy. This, uh, this is a, an event where uh, pituitary apoplexy is a clinical uh, syndrome. It's not an imaging diagnosis, it's a clinical syndrome. That means that patient presents with a sudden onset of headaches, if the tumor is large enough with visual loss that can be severe, sometimes it compresses the cavernous sinus wall with double vision and often with low cortisol because the gland is damaged. What happens is that the, there is a tumor and this tumor either bleeds or uh, gets ischemia. Like you see in this case, I'm showing you here, this tumor has this hypo intensity inside, which suggests a tumor that was taking more contrast before is now taking less contrast. So it's becoming ischemic. And this ischemia causes swelling. This swelling compresses the pituitary gland around and damages the gland. So you get low cortisol, hypocortisolemia. You get a bad headache. If you have enough pressure on the optic apparatus, you get, um, you get visual loss from that. Um, these patients, what they require first is the diagnosis of hypocortisolemia. And what they, what they require first is medical treatment with steroids. That's the most important with, with uh, hydrocortisone. Uh, that is the most important thing. Then you can consider whether to treat with an operation or we treat only medically. And that depends on a number of factors. This patient you see here, for example, was a patient I treated recently that had recently a stent place. He was on aspirin and plavix and had this episode. And he just had sudden onset of headaches with no visual loss. So I treated him conservatively and the tumor actually gradually disappeared over the following weeks and months. So you can treat apoplexy in a conservative way. Uh, some cases, large tumors, very symptomatic, it's better to do an operation to uh, relieve the pressure and remove, remove the tumor. Now, the results of surgery are usually in experienced hands really good. Uh, fortunately, pituitary surgery is a very safe and very effective operation. This is a review uh, that I did, you know, a decade ago of our own series. Um, but the, the results in this category more or less have remained the same. Um, uh, so the, the rate of new pituitary deficit after an operation depends on the tumor size. And of course, depends on the status of the function of the gland before the operation. But considering the gland was normal before the operation, most of the time it's normal after. The rate of new deficiency is only between five, between one and 5%. If the rate of new diabetes insipida that becomes permanent is between one and 2% only. 
and the rate of hormonal improvement, patients that have low hormones, but they get better after the operation, is between 20 and 35% approximately. So as we say, we are not very good at improving the gland function, but we are very good in surgery at preserving the uh, pituitary gland uh, function. The uh, outcomes, uh, clinical outcomes are very good for vision. Most patients do get better, about 80% would get better or would normalize. Uh, it's rare that patients get worse. And usually when they get worse, it's because there is a complication, like there is a hematoma after the operation, uh, is probably the most common cause of visual deterioration. Um, the CSF leak rate, uh, that is leakage of fluid through the nose, because there is an opening that was not uh, fixed or the fixed fail, uh, it depends uh, on the techniques and how extensive it is, but it can rate from 2% to 5%, even below 1%, depending on the technique you use and, and how you, the type of tumors you treat. But generally it's about 2%, so it's a really low uh, leak rate. And most importantly, the risk of injury to the coronary artery. In this uh, series, was uh, there were two cases, is 0.3%. Generally, it depends on the experience of the surgeon. I personally have not had a single injury to the coronary in well over a thousand. Actually, this was a bit outdated, but close to 2,000 in the nasal operations, not a single injury caused uh, doing these, these operations. But uh, this is something you need to be very careful, and, and it depends very much on the expertise of the surgeon. That's why it is imperative these days to be fellowship trained after residency in residency to be fellowship trained to do these operations. We expect patients, we expect surgeons to be specialized when they go into the field of pituitary surgery. In residency, you can be, learn the basics, but to do more advanced pituitary surgery, um, you need to do fellowship. Uh, because you see here, the outcomes are directly related to the expertise of the uh, surgeon. And uh, uh, you see that the reporting, comp the complications reporting uh, increases uh, as the number of cases are less and less, of course. And uh, also the outcomes for functional tumors uh, also improves dramatically with the expertise of the surgeon. So that's also why it's so important to be fellowship trained for this. And at institutions, it's important that there is one or two, and if it's a very large institution, maybe three, pituitary surgeons, no more. Is there is no place for occasional pituitary surgery. There is no room for you know five different surgeries doing pituitary surgery. It's not good for patients. It has to be dedicated on one or two, ideally, that they are very well trained and they gain experience because the results will be significantly uh, better. That being said, you know when we look at the overall remission rates uh, for functional pituitary tumors, and this is based on published studies. This is not my own. This is published studies. The for prolactinomas, you know is relatively good, although it depends a lot on the selection of the case, for sure. Uh, for Cushing's disease, also it's around 90% or uh, approximately there. Acromegaly has been traditionally an area where achieving complete remission, all of which has been quite poor. Only about 50, 60% of cases we achieve. And this is, we just found out that this is because these tumors, as we mentioned before, they are PIT1 positive. They invade more the cavernous sinus. Um, and we also learned in our experience, initial experience, you know, a decade ago, that these tumors, the resection rates correlate very much with the uh, tumor size, but even more so with the invasion of the cavernous sinus. So the tumor, the more invaded, the more rate of invasion, the less the resection rate. Um, you're probably not familiar with this, but there is, an, there is a classification based on the MRI that is called the NOSP classification. NOSP is, a, is an Austrian uh, uh, neurosurgeon that developed this a couple of decades ago. And, you know, just looking at the MRI, if the tumor, you know, you do a line along the current artery uh, here, and this is a grade zero where the tumor does not touch, the barely touches the cavern of sinus. Then there is a NOSP one, the tumor touches the wall of the cavern of sinus. NOSP two, where it's pushing on the wall and poking a little bit here. NOSP three, where it really, is going into the cavernous sinus or really compressing the cavernous sinus wall. And then NOS4 is when it's truly invading the cavernous sinus and surrounding the coronary artery. So depending on how, the degree of invasion, as you see NOS3 and 4, the high NOS grades, grades when there is, you know, for sure or very likely invasion of the cavernous sinus, those are the tumors that we cannot remove uh, effectively. However, this has been changing. And this is one of the focus of my study over the last year, year the last decade, which 
uh, is in the anatomy and the surgery of the cavernous sinus. So what is the cavernous sinus? It is an area, it's a venous space that is on each side of the pituitary gland that contains the carotid artery. And that's why it's an area that's been feared for many years because the carotid artery is there and there is a risk of injury in the carotid artery. And uh, we can look at this cavernous sinus from above or from an endonasal. You know, it has different walls. Uh, and it's important to understand this when you do these operations. Uh, but uh, basically, we described how there are ligaments that uh, go from this lining, which is called the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. There is a membrane that separates the pituitary gland from the uh, cavernous sinus cavity itself. And tumors may invade this membrane and go into the cavernous sinus. And uh, they become more problematic, especially when they are functional, because you would have to remove this membrane or go into the cavernous sinus to uh, get a complete tumor remission. You can see in this uh, illustration that we published recently, this will be in the cover of Journal of Neurosurgery this month of November. I believe this is the most accurate illustration or representation of the cellular parasitic region ever done from an endonasal approach. Um, I work with a phenomenal artist, uh, uh, Josh Klein from the Neurosurgical Atlas, which I'm sure many of you know. and uh, and this is based on our research in the laboratory. And you see, this is the pituitary gland. There is, this is the, what we call the meningeal dura that covers the pituitary gland. And from that meningeal layer, there are ligaments that go towards the pituitary gland, towards the carotid artery. Uh, it's called the carotid ligament, CCL. This is inferior parasitic ligament, uh, posterior in the back. This is way too complex for, for med students, but this is anatomy, the message I wanna send you, this is anatomy that we've described recently that has uh, increased our knowledge and our ability to do surgery safely in the cavernous sinus to you know, increase our remission rates and our, our surgical results. This is the paper I was uh, mentioning. And this is based also on studies we did a few years ago on the anatomy of the middle wall of the cavernous sinus. Uh, so for those of you that wanted to go in the surgical field, remember that the anatomy, understanding of the anatomy is the most important thing for, for us uh, surgeons. And particularly for neurosurgeons, uh, understanding the surgical neuroanatomy is key because it's, that's the way we do an operation, understanding the anatomy. So we describe these ligaments uh, and we describe a technique to remove this wall of the cavernous sinus in a step-by-step -step basis. Um, you can see here a cartoon illustrating this. And this is a brief illustration of, of, of this technique. And you see, as we said, we go through the sinuses or ENT colleagues will do this initial part of the operation. Once we're in the sphenoid sinus, uh, they continue driving the endoscope, and then we use our two hands to uh, drill on the cella to expand our opening. And here is uh, where we start making a difference uh, because we expand this to the paracellular space to expose the entire wall of the cavernous sinus. So there are tumors where there is still a remnant in that wall of the cavernous sinus, but we learn how to open it up and we learn how to safely separate this from the carotid artery. And this in the cartoon looks very simple, but and sometimes it's not very difficult, sometimes it's relatively straightforward but sometimes the tumor is really stuck to the carotid artery, so it, it becomes quite difficult. Sometimes tumors just go beyond the wall and they go into different areas of the cavernous sinus that we also described, different compartments. Um, different compartments that um, are important to understand is more from a surgical point of view, more than the NOS classification I showed you before, that is just a line and it's based on the MRI. This anatomical classification gives you a spatial relationship of structures when you work and navigate inside the cavernous sinus. Um, so I'm gonna show you some examples um, and I'll skip some of the videos because yes, there is no, there is no time. And, and, uh, but this, I'm gonna show you a couple of, this is a non-functioning adenoma, we call a gonadotroph adenoma. Uh, and you see this tumor has uh, you know, extension into the parasillary space, into the cavernous sinus. This patient presents with amenorrhea, very common. Prolactin is 40, prolactin level is usually about about up to 25 or so are normal. 40 is mildly elevated. This is, this is not a prolactinoma. If you were a tiny tumor, you could still suspect it could be a prolactinoma, but it's a larger tumor. So this is definitely a, a non a non secreting tumor, not a prolactinoma. So we don't try medication for this. We just go into surgery and it's compressing the optic apparatus. It's a young patient, surgery is indicated. So, and, and just uh, so you a little bit of the operation going in. Uh, we drill all the bone of the cella. And uh, you see, we're taking the bone lateral. And you can see that the carotid artery there 
we use a Doppler also to identify the color already. And, uh, you know, with a microscope, you would not see Laro at all. You would be so limited. With this, we can see so well. So you see, we can, these tumors often are easy to aspirate. You see, that's the pituitary gland, nice pituitary gland on the side. Then this is the tumor that is invading into the cavernous center. So now I'm opening the anterior wall of the cavernous center with these instruments we design. And you get venous bleeding. You know, the, as we said, cavernous center is a venous cavity, but it's low pressure bleeding. That's easy to control. And uh, what we're doing now is we're going to start going to the cavernous sinus to uh, remove tumor. We see that is the inferior hypopsial artery we talked about. And uh, we just clean the tumor inside the cavernous sinus. We see some ligaments. So when you work here, you need to really understand everything that's going on. And you need to make a good interpretation of the things you are seeing. Uh, so you know uh, how to prevent injury in these things. So I'm just going to jump to see you at the very end. Uh, you know, the carotid artery right here and how we are cutting this wall that is stuck to it. And then there is a six nerve that we expose right here and we stimulate. And this is the carotid artery pulls it on at the end. So you can see how we can nice, nicely and safely really remove tumor around the uh, cavernous carotid artery and, uh, and uh, get a complete tumor resection in tumor just, just like this. And you can see this is the post of MRI with you no know, nice recovery of the gland and, and no invasion of the cavernous sinus anymore, etc. Another type of non-functional adenoma is what we call a silent corticotrop. The, uh, the tumor stains for ACTH, but it doesn't produce active ACTH, and therefore they have no Cushing's disease. These are more invasive tumors, and you see this is a large, larger adenoma also in between the cavernous sinus, and you know this after the operation also complete tumor resection. Uh, in this case, you know, the patient got some transient diplopia because of the cavernous sinus, the nerves that are within the cavernous sinus. And uh, I'm going to maybe show you uh, a little clip here. Uh, this is, I want to show you how, well, in this case, we got a bit of bleeding from the carotid artery. That's the origin of the inferior hypophysial artery. This happens rarely, uh, and this, I guess, I did a few years ago, but even in those cases, we can effectively coagulate that little hole and stop the bleeding. You see the whole carotid artery exposed and a very nice resection in a patient that uh, has remained free of tumor until, until this date. Um, so if I move to functional tumors quickly, you know, acromegaly patients or, uh, are, you know, we diagnose them because they have elevation of the IGF-1, which is produced in the liver, uh, stimulated by the growth hormone. And uh, uh, the importance of the acromegaly is just, no, not just that they, have changes in physical appearance, as you know, larger mandible than your hands and feet, is that, is that there is a, an impact on, uh, of, on, on your overall health, increase of cardiac disease, increased risk of cancer. So it's important to, uh, get, to get these patients uh, in, in remission. As you may remember, if these patients get this tumor before uh, the, the closure of the cartilage, they will develop giantism. So if you have this tumor when you are in your teenage, uh, you will develop gigantism is after, is just acromegaly, as you see uh, in this case. And uh, patients with acromegaly, they all have a lot of soft tissue swelling. And you see this patient you see here, this patient has so much soft tissue swelling that uh, before he was diagnosed, he had difficulty breathing and they needed to do a, an emergent tracheostomy uh, that uh, uh, we were able to close after an operation, but he needed that because the soft tissue is so, was so bad. This is an extreme case, but the majority of these patients do present with, um, with um, um, uh, obstructive uh, apnea. Um, so what we do in these cases, um, we, when we do these operations, um, I'm gonna show you these examples, you know, even a tumor like this, what we've learned over the years, is these tumors, even that small, could potentially be invading the cavernous sinus wall. And if you don't recognize that, these patients do not get incomplete remission. So I'm doing this exposure here of this tumor. And what I'm gonna show you here is that, um, so let me go here. So I'm taking the tumor the right there, and that's the easy part. Uh, but when I get to the wall of the cavernous sinus, there is some tumor there that is stuck right there. You see those implants? And it, that doesn't come easily. I cannot grab it and remove it. So I have to actually remove the wall because that is implant, implanted in the wall. And uh, again, we develop this technique as I saw you before, and then we can uh, 
we can um, control the bleeding from the carbon of sinus and gradually remove this wall. And you know what we do is we do this in a step-by-step -step fashion. That's the wall being removed. And also we send to the pathologist. So they study it, they see whether there is humor on it. And you know, this is the key to improve your outcomes. Uh, but this technically is challenging and it requires again significant training. Um, highly complex cases. I'm gonna skip to this uh, a little bit in the interest of time, but even cases that in the past we thought were incurable, we can cure with more advanced technique these days, like this uh, very large invasive uh, tumor. Uh, even tumors that were left behind the carbon of sinus, this person from Israel um, came to Stanford for surgery. See, he had on a previous operation, I was told that this, this tumor is impossible to remove because it's very fibrous. And uh, the tumor was quite fibrous, but we were able to nicely remove it. It's all about having the proper exposure, understanding the anatomy, applying the right technique. And this tumor, we were able to remove it entirely from within the cavern of sinus. Uh, this whitest thing here you see here is the tumor. And this patient is uh, now uh, more than six months in remission. You see this green thing is some dye we use in the operation. This is the carotid artery. You can inject it intravenously and you can see how it lights up and you can identify the carotid artery in this case. So all acromegaly outcomes improved dramatically. My own series was about 50% remission a decade before, and now it's above 90%. And that is because of these better uh, techniques. You wanna know more details about this. This is a paper we published recently on this topic. Um, and again, as I said before, um, radiotherapy should be last resort, in my opinion, uh, when everything else has been exhausted. And uh, in my series, only 2% of patients will need it. Uh, for example, tumors like this, this is a patient with acromegaly, they were recommending radiating that uh, tumor there. I said, we can remove it. And we did remove it. This patient from New York, who was thanking us for uh, being able and willing to remove this tumor. Because, you know, radio surgery is not as effective and it takes time to uh, be effective when it is and it can damage the pituitary gland. So there are many downsides of, of, of using it when you have a better alternative. Sometimes there is, is the best option, but often there are other alternatives. The same like this one, this tumor, in this case, is stuck to the optic apparatus that we also uh, removed. Um, so these are some of my, my series, but this is too, again too specific, but I wanna send you the message that the invasion of the carbon of sinus, when you look for it, as they say, the more you know, the more you see, uh, it is much more frequent than, than previously reported because about half of my patients do have cavernous sinus invasion and we identify that. And that has, you know, uh, helped us achieve, you know, very good levels of remission uh, for these patients. Now, ACTH adenomas, the Koskoshin disease, this is also devastating disease. You know, hypercortisolism uh, have mul has multiple effects on your, on, your, on your overall health, you know, um, high uh, glucose, you know, develop diabetes, um, Hypertension, skin changes, uh, you know, increase significant increase in body weight, increased risk of uh, thrombosis, and multiple side effects, and most important, I don't know, if you will have an endocrinologist giving you a talk or not, but it's important to know how to diagnose Cushing's disease. For the, there are three steps. The first step is you need to show that there is hypercortisolism. Usually, you need to collect uh, cortisol levels for 24 hours. A single cortisol level will never tell you if there is the cortisol is elevated or not. You need 24 hours collection. There is also the option of doing salivary midnight cortisol. But just remember for now, 24 hours during cortisol. If that is elevated, you need to determine whether it's coming from the pituitary or not. And the way you know is whether it's ACTH dependent or not. Is it because of ACTH is elevated from the pituitary? that tell you this from the pituitary or not. And you can also do a dexamethasone suppression test. Theory, in theory, in uh, normally the uh, cortisol should be suppressed with a dexamethasone suppression test. If it remains elevated, means you have hypercortisolism um, uh, and, uh, and you need to find out why. Then is it pituitary origin? Uh, you need to do an MRI. Is there something in the MRI or not? If it's a large tumor, you know, it's from there. But what happens in Cushing's disease is very tricky. Sometimes there are tumors that are only one, two, three millimeters. Too difficult to know whether that little thing in the MRI is a tumor or not. In these cases, what is done is the IPSS, inferior petrosal sinus sampling, is a test angiogram where they measure 
the ACTH levels that come out of, this, of those venous sinuses. If they come from the sinuses around the pituitary gland, means the pituitary gland is the source of the Cousin's disease, means you need to treat the uh, disease with pituitary uh, surgery. Um, as we said, it's a challenge sometimes. We'll be, sometimes we have what we call a negative MRI. You cannot find the tumor on the MRI, so you need to find it in the pituitary gland with different surgical techniques. But when you have experience, you can do it. Uh, as, as we said, even patients with the other extreme, bilateral cavernous sinus disease we can cure, like this like this guy I did some years ago. Look at the change in his DNA, uh, in, in his, in his um, ID picture, uh, complete change uh, after uh, being in remission. Like this girl, look at the complete change being uh, in cousins, that's the opposite. And this is a case where the tumor was in the wall of the cavernous sinus that we uh, removed entirely because we knew how to access the tumor in the wall of the cavernous sinus. The same with this other kid. This is another kid. This is also from Lebanon, out of the state with two previous operations and the tumor is stuck to the carotid artery. And we were able to, uh, you know, using the same techniques I'll show you, just remove this tumor entirely from the cavernous sinus, it's stuck to the carotid, but understanding these ligaments, we were able to remove this tumor and get him in, in complete remission. Um, and lastly, prolactinomas, as we said before, medication first, but there are patients where we can uh, uh, recommend surgery either because the medication fails or the medication has multiple side effects or sometimes patients do prefer an operation. When I see patients, especially when they are young, if they have a tumor that is relatively easy to remove, that I believe I can remove it completely, then surgery is highly effective and is curative in 95% or more of the cases. And you don't have to take medication for all your life or for a number of years. So in those cases, especially young female with tumors that are relatively small, surgery makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense in the mid and in the long term uh, because you get often a cure. However, patient like this, a young, young male patient that comes with headaches, his plaque levels are 3000 and he has this, this large mass. His vision is mildly affected, but just mild, uh, maybe a superior quadrant defect the mo at the most. Um, you need to, you know, as, as a surgeon, sometimes you see a tumor and you want to remove it. This is a mistake. This a tumor like this with no acute symptoms. This needs to be treated with medication first. This patient was placed on medication, really effective. Tumor is shrinking and he's doing very well. This is a tumor that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to cure with surgery. It's too invasive to remove it all completely. So medication should be first. Um, this other tumor was a bit borderline in this case because there were these cystic chains that you see up here. This patient had a very rapid decline of vision. And in spite of being a prolactinoma, I thought that surgery in this case good help. And I did an operation. His prolactin levels actually normalized right after surgery and remained like that without a need for medication. But even in that case like this, even if the prolactin levels raise in the future, you can start medication if needed. But with rapid visual loss, his visual fields improved dramatically. So visual loss does not mean surgery, only if it's rapid, rapidly progressive and the cystic changes, surgery is a, is a reasonable option. Uh, and as we said, some patients do have the choice of surgery. This patient uh, that came to me uh, with a small prolactinoma, an actually difficult one because this one is stuck to the carotid, as you see here. This is invading the cavernous sinus medial wall and something we call the clenodal space. Uh, but this patient was taking medication and he, has, he was having significant side effects from it. He was having depression. And these medications in a subset of patients do cause mood, you know, decline or difficult, you know, patients with psychotic history, depression, psychotic disease, uh, might not do very well on these medications. And in this case, surgery might be a better option to either cure the tumor or to reduce the need for medication. And in this case, we did this operation and we were able to remove the tumor uh, entirely, even though it was invasive into the cavernous sinus and into this clenodal space, it was difficult, uh, but we get a complete resection. You see the whole carotid artery nicely dissected, complete resection. This patient who is now two years post-op has prolactin normal with no medication. Um, so just uh, to wrap it up, uh, what do we do after surgery in these patients? 
my practice, I do not use a lumbar drain, almost never for pituitary tumors. We do not use nasal packing these days. The, the ENTs put some internal packing that is absorbable. Uh, so we don't use those tampons anymore. Metasol packing that's outdated. Hospital stays one to two days. Uh, it depends on the number of factors, but uh, it's usually about one or two days. Uh, we'd have a possible visit uh, one or two weeks after the operation with me and with the ENT surgeon, also with the endocrinology to follow up on labs. And we have a number of restrictions, uh, but usually these patients uh, recover uh, very well, even those can travel you know, after one or two weeks, um, depending on the, the risk of CSF leakage is the main determining factor to, to travel back to travel back home, but usually go back to work in four to, four to six weeks. So this is uh, an overview of uh, pituitary tumors, pituitary anatomy, uh, uh, pituitary surgery in particular, that I hope uh, is been useful to you guys. Thank you. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.